please rise for the first move. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome. Today is November 27th, 2017. Can I have a roll call, please? Basil? Here. Meyer? Here. Krause? Here. Missouri? Here. Krause? Here. Really? Here. We have the minutes from November 13th. Are there any changes? If not, is there a motion? So moved. Second. That motion made, and there is a second. Any questions in the motion? Roll call. Basil? Yes. Meyer? Yes. Krause? Yes. Missouri? Yes. Kaprose? Yes. Wayland? Yes. Clerk's report. Uh, the total tax income received since last month, $158,200.94. Uh, dog tags will go on sale on this Friday, December 1st. Dog tags are $10 each until March 15th, 2018, and then the price goes up. I also have a couple of thank you cards here um, for the Village Board. Uh, thank you so much for the beautiful planter. It had birds and fresh flowers. Ruth's son, Keith, took the planter home and will enjoy the memory of your thoughtfulness uh, by the family of Ruth Ollendorf. She was the previous village clerk that had recently passed away. And um, a thank you for your expressions of sympathy at the loss of my mom by um, Patty Meyer, which was also a recent death. So that's all I have. Thank you. Anyone from the audience wish to address the board today? Please state your name. Uh, Sherry Murray. I live at 549 Willow Lane. For 24 years, I've owned an RV. I purchased the home because it had a corner lot on a dead end. We thought it was a perfect spot because the side of the house had an open lot. We put concrete down. We have a hill next to us where there's a cornfield at the top of the hill. The hill is probably 10 feet high. So we are not obstructing anybody there. Uh, the other side is the house, and the back is backyards that go all the way down to Route 1. We just don't think it's fair to come after us after we've been following the rules for 24 years. This is a lifestyle for us. I do not want to store it. It's going to cost me about $1,000 a year for the size that we have. It, it's just not fair if you have a personal issue with somebody don't come after everybody else. Take care of that issue at hand. I don't know what else to say. And you can't guarantee me that that storage place over here is going to keep my RV secure. Where I'm at now, I have security cameras. It's right there. When we're ready to go, we're ready to go. We have no issues with any of the neighbors. They've all come over and taken tours. Everybody loves it. They're envious. It's just how we like to live our life on the weekends and <laughs> over the summer and we're not hurting anybody and we just don't want to be penalized for following the rules for so many years. So we just hope you consider everybody that's in the same boat. That's all I have. Thank you. This is going to be discussed later on. Yeah. I just okay. wanted Anyone else? Uh, uh, my issue is the same. Okay. Your name, uh, Terry Sparnberg. Uh, I have the same concerns about the 25 foot uh, length of vehicles or trailers. Um, I purchased, I live by Nine West Church um, about a year and a couple months. Um, I farmed and grew up around here. My kids have gone to school down here. I'm originally from Crete. But um, I purchased this property. One, I own a semi, and I called uh, Robert. Four times before I put an offer on the bid, that's when Mr. Willis uh, was his house to sell. And explained everything that I was going to do and what I was bringing in. Um, I've had issues with some of my neighbors and, and behind me with Walter and, and uh, Bob. And supposedly that's all been worked out. Um, I did purchase a building permit to put a barn in. Um, my wife doesn't want to look at the truck. I don't want to look at the truck. I have also have a camp that's almost 30 foot, and I'm on asphalt. And I have a neighbor down the street that 
cannot Penazos that cannot be here also has a beautiful yard and has a camper that's over 25 foot. Some of the I've drove around the neighborhoods and um, I, you guys already have an ordinance to bring it behind the house, which I agree, um, 100%. Keep it out of the way. Most people don't want to look at it. I understand that. Um, but most of the houses that I drove around in the community here, nobody else has. I, I don't know exactly. Are you guys... The temple. Okay, there's a, there's another couple that it's got same setup. They're a camper. They're their only house there, and I'm like can't speak for them either. But <clears throat> we spent a lot of money on these campers. I spent a lot of money on my equipment. I I just spent a lot of money on this property. Um, I'm young. I don't plan on moving out of the community. I want to be part of the community. And I agree. It's if somebody has a personal thing. I mean, everybody complains about government. You know, you watch the news and people get upset and have judgmental and they get all mad because the government's in everybody's business. I understand that you need to keep somewhat of an order. But this is a blue collar town. There's service trucks out here that, and farm trucks that people park that are over 25 foot. We're a blue collar town. Everybody goes to work. Pay the taxes to try to beautify as this thing, and I, I agree with them. Um, eventually, all my stuff's going to be inside, um, like I said, so it's not such a big issue, right? With this, you know, it'd be an issue to I get my building built because of the weather, but I still agree that it's, you got you have an ordinance already in place to thing, and I don't know if it's revenue or if. Mr. Canute is, is looking at it as revenue because he's the only one who owns self storage in the in the community. So I don't think it's really beneficial to anybody. And I and, and I agree, you can't make everybody happy. But you can make a point real quick. Uh, it has nothing to do with Mr. Canute. No, I, I'm just saying it, it, if you're looking at the whole. Yeah, but I, it doesn't matter to us where you store your. But don't allude to something that's not fact as far as Mr. Canute. No, I'm just saying. Okay. In in way I'm looking at inside, you guys are inside. I'm looking, you know, in, going well. Mr. Canute's been a part of the community. He's the only one that's got self storage. I'm just saying, it's better. It's going to benefit a man like him or create self storage. It's not going to benefit us as a community, people that are paying the taxes and trying to do right. But thank you. My name is Dale Murray. I'm 549 Willow. Um, so you heard from my wife, but I'm going to speak a little more on the legal aspect of this. I've been watching your videos for all the hearings so far. You guys have had on this. The only thing I've heard so far is that you don't like to look at the motorhomes. Unfortunately, the U.S. Supreme Court has already ruled that it is unconstitutional. I'll give you the, the site if you need it. Uh, you guys can look it up again. We've had this same conversation with the village board back in 2005. The U.S. Supreme Court has not changed it. I have not heard anything about it being unsafe. I haven't heard about it causing health issues, um, anything to that effect. So if you're only going on because you don't like to look at it, I don't know what the difference between a 25 foot and a 26 foot trailer is. I guess a 25 looks better than a 26. Supreme Court has said it's unconstitutional. You cannot do that. So you may want to look at that. Now I agree, the US Supreme Court says that you can say it has to be behind the house line, it can be five foot from your property line, it can't be weak in fluids, it can't be in disarray, and I agree with all that. But for what I paid for mine, which costs more than some of the houses that we have in Beecher at this time, I just feel you guys are going down an unconstitutional route if you can continue to say this is because you don't like to look at it. Thank you. Anyone else from the artist which does the work? George, two and two eleven Orchard Lane. Uh, I didn't get a water bill this month. There's some problem with the post office or whatever. Anybody else not get a water bill? Courtney has the same problem. You can have mine. <coughs> no thanks. Mine in the car. I only have one in my house. <laughs> we have those issues in our billing period. Yeah, these okay. issues. I was just curious. It's usually thirty or forty to get lost. Yeah. Yeah. Every yeah. Sign up for email, George. No, it's not happening. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Anything else?
Finance and Administration Committee, Trustee Bajan. All right. Uh, consider an ordinance adopting a tax levy for 2017, collectible in 2018. Uh, as was discussed at the strategic planning, this levy represents a zero increase in the corporate and all special tax <coughs> levies. The only exception is the bond levy, which is increasing from 85922 to $87,295, or $1,373. This increase is due to the refinancing we conducted back in February 2017, and this amount will now bounce between $85,000 and $90,000 for the next 15 years based on the amount of the principal and interest due. Uh, when looking at the tax levy chart provided behind the, uh, behind the ordinance, the village uh, board froze the operating levy in the fall of 2012, uh, making this the sixth year the village board has frozen the levy. However, as this EVA uh, declined during that same period, the tax rate increased from 0 0.6459 to 0 0.7468. Ironically, the village tax rate uh, today is still less than the high, high mark of 0 0.7508 in 1994. Since that time, the EVA has grown to keep the tax rate below this mark. Home valued at $235,000 is paying less in property tax today than it would have in 1994. However, property values have increased during this time, so of course the taxes paid uh, are increased. Uh, in close is an example of the five-year property tax history. Although the village tax is not separated out, this tax bill in increased by only $96.18 in the last five years, or an average of less than $20 a year. The assessed value dropped from $56,560 to $59.47 during the same period. Uh oh <laughs> The same period, $335,66 uh, $335 was paid to the village uh, in property taxes in 2017. Uh, it is recommended that the enclosed ordinance be approved. And this thing jumps when you touch it. Oh, that was the O. That was the O. I hit it and it went. Woo! <laughs> 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 I think we got too much sun. Uh, I got too much sun. So, um, I would like to consider uh, an ordinance adopting ordinance number 1278. 1278. I would like to consider Ordinance 1278 adopting a tax levy for 2017, collectible in 2018. Motion number four. Is there a second? Second. There's a second. Any questions in motion? Roll call. Whalen? Yes. Kokoros? Yes. Missouri? Yes. Kokoros? Yes. Maya? Yes. Hazel? Yes. Uh, status of the Illinois Municipal Insurance Cooperative, IMIC. The village obtained uh, the quarterly board of uh, attended the quarterly board of uh, directors meeting earlier in the month and a financial report is enclosed. Uh, the board voted to release all unobligated funds back to the participants that contributed to the pool after five years. This is the fourth year we uh, anticipate a release of funds next year. There is 142980 remaining from our first year of operating the pool and the original founding 13 members will be splitting the, this amount based on the side of, size of contribution. contribution. In uh, future years, we are running over $100,000 each year in excess uh, funding, and so far it is, in this year, we still have $470,000 remaining. The pool is performing as expected, and the return should start uh, to begin. <coughs> Uh, this pool was formed by the Eastern Will County Council of Mayors, Beecher, Moni, and Piatone. Crete was already in another pool. Um, we added more members, uh, communities, to make the pool viable, and, uh, and we started with 13 members, and we now have 21 members. Our goal is to have a total of 25 high-performing members uh, with a rate of return $200,000 per year. This will reduce our overall premium cost by 50% compared to 
compared to each community uh, going to market on its own. We self-fund the first 50000 of each claim and purchase insurance for the remaining coverage of up to $8 million cap per ordinance or occurrence. This thing turns blue, it's hard to read. <laughs> and there's a chart in the back that shows yes, the performance so of, of the fund over the last five years. Dashboard, we call it dashboard. So, anybody else on that? Um, okay, uh, consider a motion canceling the second meeting in December, which falls on Christmas Day. Traditionally, we have canceled the second meeting in December and due uh, to combined financial commission and committee reporting report uh, meeting of the first meeting of December. We would then go back to our routine at January 8th meeting. November's monthly reports would be due for the December 11th meeting. So. No complaints. I would like to make a motion canceling the second meeting for December. So motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. There's many seconds. Any questions today? Roll call. Basil? Yes. Meyer? Yes. Krauss? Yes. Missouri? Yes. Kapuros? Yes. Really? Yes. Nobody wants to meet on Christmas, huh? Uh, Comcast requires a notice of price increase for 2018. Uh, enclosed is the review. Looks like they're going to do increase, uh, include on some of the broadcasting and sports, uh, regional sports fees. Uh, they say that you know uh, the price of doing business keeps going up uh, with the programmers, so that's why their costs will be going up. Yeah. So that's all I have. Thank you, public buildings properties, parks, and recreation. Okay, Fireman's Park Playground update. We have a meeting on Wednesday, Wednesday morning. Uh, we're going to go through the plan design and also costs of this, and we're also going to talk about doing different stages uh, on that playground equipment. We have the location. Uh, it's going to be Wednesday here at the Village Hall. 11 o'clock? 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. Uh, safety inspections for the village buildings. Uh, in the last month, the village has had all its parks, buildings, and facilities inspected by our liability pool risk management consultant, and we're waiting the written reports. We believe that most of the corrections will have to be made on some of the equipment that are showing wear and tear in the playgrounds, in the playgrounds which, is, which is a normal, a normal thing. Ice rink update, uh, the new liner has been purchased. Yes, it is. And uh, once the leaves are uh, picked up, and uh, we can get that ice rink update. It seems like every time we get the uh, ice rink up, hopefully the weather will stay mild uh, you know, throughout the winter. We've had some winters where I don't think we've ever had ice. Had oh, the boat races. No, we've had ice. You know what, we have had ice, but it maybe wasn't too long lived. So, okay, so that's going to be uh, constructed in the next few weeks or so. That ends my report. Okay, building department monthly report is enclosed for your review. Dunkin' Donuts drive through request at 1211 Dixie update. The PZC met on November 16th and approved a public hearing set for Thursday, December 12th. It is scheduled to come before the board on January 8th. There's a typo, it's the 21st. Right, it is the 21st. I didn't catch that. Except George, go on. <laughs> Public hearing is Thursday, December 21st. Um, CMAP LTA grant update. A kickoff meeting was held where it was determined that the village and CMAP would jointly participate in the RFP process for a consultant to conduct the land use planning at an estimated cost of $100,000 to $130,000. The village's share of this project would be in the range of 10000 to 13000 We have 8000 budgeted this year, and we would have to budget another 5000 next year, but this process will be well worth it. There are plans to provide for heavy resident participation and engagement in this process through workshops and group meetings. The PZC will be the lead steering committee in this process, as is normal, and will require a significant amount of time on the part of these commissioners. This will be the first comprehensive plan rewrite in the village the village has conducted since 2005. The project will begin this spring and will be completed by the summer of 2019. 
Consider an ordinance adding section 9516 of the village code pertaining to the parking of oversized vehicles and trailers within all property of the village. This is a continuation of the discussion the board had at its October 23rd meeting on this ordinance. The committee met for several hours one evening in September and decided to propose the enclosed ordinance and make it part of the municipal code and not the zoning ordinance so it could be more easily enforced by the police department and interpreted by the code enforcement officer. In short, that any vehicle or trailer in excess of 25 feet in length cannot be parked anywhere in the village for more than three days unless on property license for such use. All recreational trailers and vehicles must also be parked on asphalt of concrete service and be at least five inches from the property line. Last month, the board asked to see photos of the trailers taken throughout the community and shared with the committee so it could be visualized as to the type of violations that may or may not exist under the current zoning ordinance and the proposed municipal ordinance. A presentation has been prepared, which will be made at the meeting of photos shared with the committee. Action on this ordinance is to the discretion of this board. All right, I hope this works. Uh, Dennis Tagenhort is here tonight. He's the code enforcement officer. And he's the one who took these pictures. They were taken over Labor Day weekend. And we will just go through, and hopefully this will work for me, um, of all the pictures. They're not in any given order. Um, so don't get hung up on, you know, you're going to see one from the west side of town and one from the east side of town. They got all mixed and matched because at one point we began to edit these photos. And then we said, you know what, let's just show you all 128 and make it real quick. Okay, here's a boat parked on a shoulder. Uh, this would be okay for three days under both ordinances. But we've had, had instances where these things exist for more than three days on a shoulder. Are all the pictures we're going to look at a violation? No. No. Okay. Well, I agree with that. You? Sure. Oh. Sorry, I'm going to see if I can get this to work. Why didn't I? Hold on, give me one second here. Here's an example of a trailer parked in the backyard. Um, I don't know if this trailer exceeds 25 feet in length. It does. It um, does. It does? Okay. Yep. But it's parked in the rear yard. That's who I was talking about. No surface. Sir. No surface. Yep. Sir, let them give their presentation. Oh. That's no surface. This one is, is parked in the front yard setback. It would be a violation. Also, one tire is on the grass. Uh, again, if he had it there for three days or less, it would be okay if it was fully parked on the driveway. Here's one in the backyard of a two and a half acre lot. I believe that's off Church Road. Yeah. Uh, here's the one, I believe this is, is attached to the pole and someone's trying to sell it. It's probably a ski do or something like that on a trailer. Here's, here's a boat in the driveway. Again, the boat is covered, so I assume the guy's done using it for the year, so it has to be moved. You'd be allowed to keep it there for three days under the existing ordinance. But under both the existing and proposed ordinance, this would not be allowed. Here's, a, here's an example of a boat that is in conformance with both the new and the, and the current ordinance. Uh, it's less than 25 feet in length. It's more than five foot off the property line, parked on a hard surface behind the front building setback. So that would be an example of a legal under both the current and proposed ordinance. Here's one that would be considered legal. Uh, it's parked on a hard surface behind the front yard setback. It is less than 25 feet. Here's a little trailer we found parked. It's actually uh, facing Dixie Highway, if you notice. Uh, across the street is the Beecher Plaza. Uh, so that one is, you can't see it from Dixie Highway, but it's in the, in the rear yard. Here's a trailer that's parked on the grass surface, partially on the grass, partially on hard surface. Uh, it is in the front yard setback because the garage uh, is actually in front of the main building line. We consider the front of the garage in that case to be the front building line. Here's one parked in the backyard. Uh, as you see, it probably violates the five foot off property line rule because this person here only has about 10 foot of rear yard. As you can see the back door right there, on that, on that one. 
And I'm going fast. If you want to stop or ask a question, I'll be the code enforcement officer and myself. Please stop and ask a question. Here's a pontoon boat on a trailer parked in the back. I believe in this case, there's another trailer behind it, but you just can't see it in this photograph. I don't know. Do you remember that thing? <coughs> that particular one, uh, it's actually covered. It's uh, two part there. Okay. <coughs> Again, I don't know if that's greater or less than 25 feet. That one is more. It is. Here's one where a guy actually poured a slab on the side of his garage to store his boat. But unfortunately, he's on a corner lot, so that boat's in the front yard setback. So that, that boat technically violates not only the proposed ordinance, but the current ordinance. Because he's in the front yard with that boat. Uh, here's one that's been out there for a while. Now, if you go by and you would assume, okay, they're working on the house, um, that's a, a contractor's trailer, but I believe that, that thing's been there for quite some time. Yeah, they so since moved. Be, it's been removed? Okay. Since moved, totally. Okay, so that would be in violation because they're greater than three days and they didn't ask the police, hey, we're working on the house, give us some more time. Uh, here's a, looks like a little flatbed utility trailer parked on, on uh, grass, not on asphalt or concrete. It is in the rear yard setback because it's a detached garage, so that would technically be in the backyard. Here's a trailer. It's a contractor's trailer park in the back. If you look real close, you'll see that the trailer is on grass. It's not on hard surface back there. I assume we pushed it that far back so he can get more cars in his driveway, but that technically would be a violation of the proposed ordinance, probably not a violation of the current ordinance. Uh, here's an example of a trailer in a driveway. It's in the front yard setback, so this is technically not allowed. I don't know exactly where the house is. That's a detached garage, but if I recall, that trailer was kind of protruding a little bit beyond the front line of the house. So that would be a, a violation of both the proposed and current ordinance if that were the case. Yeah, that one, these are both on woodwork, woodwork next to each other. Okay, I'd like to not get to where they are. Okay. okay that's, we're not picking on people, it's just a general observation. Uh, here, I like this one because here it shows a garage with no hard surface. Now, I don't know if this guy had a stone driveway and the grass grew in through it, but technically that trailer would be a violation of the proposed ordinance because there is no driveway for the garage. Would that not be existing? What do you mean by that? A violation of existing not being on an impervious surface? That probably would be a violation of the existing as well, yes. But it, it's a tough one. I, I don't know if there's stone there underneath that grass or what the deal's going on. Do you know if that's the back or front of the house? I want to know because I'm keeping track of how many that's the front. that you're showing that are in violation of proposal. Well, only, only proposed. Okay. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. we, a lot of these that you're showing are in violation of current existing. What I want to know is how many that we see would be in violation. You know, okay. would be in violation of the proposed. What? What? Who would be affected here? Yes, you know I've seen I've seen one so far. Is that in violation of proposed or, or current and proposed? Yeah, that's current. Because I don't know where the house is there. Yeah. Would yeah. be a violation of current as well? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, here's one in the rear yard. It is the tires themselves are sitting on concrete patio blocks. Um, the rest of the trailer is over grass. You can see the trailer is protruding on one side. So either the individual is either cleaning it out or someone could even be using it or living in it. It's in a rear yard. Uh, it may not be a violation of the current ordinance, but it would be a violation of the proposed ordinance um, because it's probably greater than 25 feet. Yes. And we have to differentiate as to whether or not that's sitting on concrete or grass. I would venture to say we have to do a further definition. To me, that's sitting on grass. The entire trailer should be on hard surface if, if that's the way you're going to go with it. So that's just an example there where a guy parked the, the wheels on, on concrete. So would that be a violation currently or no? Mm, I would say no. It doesn't seem like hard surface. So I don't know. <laughs> so just concrete blocks under a tire constitute an impervious surface? So and again, it's in the rear of the yard. You huh? just asked if it's a violation of the ordinance. Sir, this is time for the board to deliberate. Oh, I'm sorry. So. Dennis, my question is, with the code, trailers must be parked on an impervious surface. Correct. Correct. Okay. Does tires being underneath 
concrete blocks constitute parking it on an impervious surface? Probably <coughs> not. No. Okay. So that's in, yeah. that would be in violation yeah. of current But that would be that would be up to a judge to decide, not us, if it went that right. far. Yeah. Okay. I would say it's a violation. Uh, here's a boat that's parked in the rear yard setback because the house is detached, but it's on grass. It's not on hard surface. It's not on concrete or asphalt. This would be a violation of current and proposed. It's part of the grass. Again, you can do it for three days, but then you have to get it out of there. I, we just threw this in there. Here's a car parked on the grass. I mean, we've got some of this going on, too. You know, this is uh, in our commercial district in the rear. Here's a trailer that's parked. Uh, this is a unique situation. This is a detached garage on a corner lot. Um, that trailer, if you line it up with the front of the house, it's probably in the rear yard setback, but that garage is probably 150 to 200 feet from the house itself. So, you know, it, it's an iffy one. We would probably not address it unless we had a specific complaint on that one. Here's a guy with a fishing boat, a bass boat in the back. That's legal under both current and proposed. It's less than 25 feet, parked in the rear, and it's on driveway. Here's one that is legal because the house protrudes beyond the uh, garage there. It's parked on hard surface. So that would be probably legal under current and proposed. Uh, but again, from the street, it's very visible. It's sitting right there. Here's a trailer in a one acre lot parked way in the back. Now, how Dennis found that one back there, I do not know. But I don't believe you can see that one from the street. That one's way back there, isn't it? It's no, actually, you can see it. Can you? Mm -hmm. All right, but it's parked on the it's grass. Up on the, hill. Um, the grass is mowed. Under most of these trailers, you will notice they are mowing them, so they have to move in these trailers. Uh, but that would probably be uh, in violation of the current end of the proposed ordinance. Uh, we threw this one in there. Again, our ordinances don't address this, but here's an antique vehicle that's covered and sitting on our shoulder. If it's a plated vehicle, there's really nothing you can do about it, but that is the situation there. Uh, here's a trailer that's probably legal. It's parked in the rear yard setback. It is on a driveway or concrete. I believe it's less than 25 feet in length, so that would be legal under both current and proposed. Uh, here's a boat in the back by an alley. I guess you could make the argument it's not five foot off the property line because the alley is 20 feet wide and extends beyond the paved corner there. Uh, this individual has the, the boat trailer wedge between the alley and the back of the garage. Again, it's way in the back. We haven't really addressed these, these types of trailer parkings because they're along the alley back there. But I guess technically it's a violation of both the current and the proposed ordinance. But it's probably not five foot off the alley. Here's another example of the same thing. Uh, this individual is further off the alley, but he's parked on concrete with his axles, but some of the trailer protrudes into the grassy area there. Again, I don't know if that's 25 feet or shorter, I don't know. Again, another vehicle parked. And I guess the only reason we threw these in here for the committee to look at at the time is what's the difference between this and a trailer? I really don't know. But if that vehicle is plated, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, here's some tractors that are parked in the uh, side of a, of a building along with a utility trailer. Uh, they are in, the, the trailer itself is not in violation of the current or proposed ordinance because it is actually behind the front yard setback. I believe that trailer might be less than 20, if it's greater than 25 feet in length, it would be in violation of the proposed. The tractors, even though the, the person that has those tractors say they're ornamental, technically that would be a violation because they're parked on the grass. But again, these tractors are considered implements of husbandry and not a recreational trailer, camper, RV, or boat. So they fall into a whole separate category of what falls under the, the vehicle code, I would assume. Is that correct, Dennis? If right. we had complaints of farm tractors right. parked in areas. Uh, here's two trailers on a lot. Uh, our ordinance does not specify how many trailers you can or cannot have on a lot, but here's an example of where you have two trailers on a lot. Um, one is parked halfway on hard concrete, the other one's just back in the weeds back there. 
uh, that's another picture of that same boat that's kind of parked on hard surface and you could say yeah it is yes and no it's not because again you've got stuff growing out of the hard surface here's a trailer parked in the street off the dead end uh, this to me would be strictly an IVC issue it would not be a, uh, a zoning issue because it's in the street right away so that would be something that our 3 d ordinance would have to address well, again, there's just a pile of debris laying around somewhere, covered. That, that would be a violation. Here's a boat in the back. Uh, this is a unique situation where this property backs up to commercial property. And the building you see there, uh, the back of that building is actually a commercial building. Uh, this, this boat probably would be a violation of both current and proposed because it's parked on the grass. This one, too, is parked on the grass. It would be a violation if it was there for longer than three days. Um, again, I don't know, by looking at the garage and the parking lot there, I, I would assume that's in a rear yard setback and up against commercial property. There's another boat in the backyard. Um, again, one tire's on the grass, the other one's in the driveway, but it kind of lines up with the garage. So that's a real iffy one as to whether or not you consider that acceptable as being on hard surface or not. Uh, technically, to the letter of the law, it probably isn't. So some of these where they have one wheel parked on the grass, though, if they did a better parking job, they're not in violation of that. Yeah, and this one is lined up with that one garage door almost. So, yeah, I guess if he's over a couple more feet, you know, I, I don't know if that's really a violation or something they're hung up on. And then I like this one. Not only is this individual using it for storage, we've got kids' toys in the boat, we've got gas cans parked underneath the boat, um, ready to roll there. Uh, here again is another example. We got a trailer, might be under 25 feet. It's in the rear yard setback because you can see the rear windows of the home there. This is on a corner lot, so technically, Dennis, this detached garage on a corner lot, this would probably be the front yard setback. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. So that would be a violation of both current and proposed. But if that was in the rear yard setback and less than 25 feet, that might be legal. There is a, a picture of a, a trailer parked in the grass in the rear yard. Uh, it's probably a violation of both the current and the proposed ordinance because it's not parked on hard surface. And I don't know if that's over 25 feet or not. Right? It is. It is over 25 feet. That's over? Yeah, whatever that is. There's, a, there's an example of a tractor parked in the driveway of a residential driveway of a garage. Our ordinances do not address this currently. Uh, there's some more trailers parked in the back. Uh, there again, you're, you're on stone. So this might be okay under the current ordinance. Under the proposed ordinance, it says it must be asphalt or concrete. This is an example of where then they would be in violation. Uh, this is a legal uh, parking of a trailer, both in the proposed and the current ordinance. It's on driveway and rear at setback. Uh, you just can see it from the street very well because his driveway does occur. He has a side road garage, so it, the, the trailer is very visible there. Uh, here's another example of two trailers. You've got one uh, in the front yard setback, a boat. Uh, that would have to only be allowed there for three days under both ordinances. But there's also another little trailer, if you look close, uh, parked alongside the garage back there. Uh, that is on grass, so that would be a violation of both ordinances as well. Another picture of that one. This one is an interesting picture. There's one concern that, that was expressed is no one should have to look out their rear window and have to look at a camper or RV. Unfortunately, in this case, because of where this gray house is located, the trailer for the, the yellow house, I assume the person in the yellow house owns that trailer, uh, that trailer is parked legally in both the current and the proposed ordinance. But because that house has such a small setback in the rear yard, they're looking right at that trailer out there back window. And that was one example we found in town where <coughs> there's nothing we can really do for that resident on the corner there because he just has very little setback of his own. Here's a, a boat that's parked in a vacant lot, definitely a violation of both the current and the proposed ordinance. Even if this individual owned that lot, and I doubt if he does, uh, you still can't allow an accessory use uh, on a primary use residential lot. This is a unique situation where the individual that owns this truck and trailer that parks it there overnight <coughs> is actually maintaining the entire subdivision. 
at the mowers and equipment for maintaining the vacant lots in the subdivision are contained in that trailer. So we have been kind of lax on enforcing it for that individual because he parks his equipment there and maintains that entire subdivision. As you can see, his truck's hooked up to that trailer. This is the, the situation that, that started this whole discussion. This is where the guy was trying to back his trailer into a side yard uh, adjacent in, in that neighborhood. And that's what started the discussion. And that is the end of the presentation of the pictures that the committee looked at uh, probably two months ago. It, it helps to see the pictures. Um, I really wrestle with this one. Um, I get since the last meeting, I went and drove around town. I went up and down every alley in every neighborhood, you know, trying to see where everybody's parked, what it looks like. And the tough part is that the one that started this whole thing is in a more congested area that impacts a lot of people, where some of the stuff in other parts of town do not. But the thing we wrestle with is. How do you set something up that's fair to everybody that isn't discriminating against one particular neighborhood where it's more of a problem than someplace else where it isn't? And I, that's something I'm still kind of kicking around. It's not a matter of looks, of us, you know, discriminating Supreme Court-wise over what something looks like. It's a matter of we have to represent everybody. So we have people that come to us that are upset about how things look, not necessarily yours, but we've got to look at both sides of everything. We can't just say that, you know, it, I don't give a care about, you know, what a motorhome looks like. That's got nothing to do with it. But we represent people who do. So we have to look at both sides of it. Let me just straighten that up as far as the Supreme Court goes. So I, I got a couple of questions. In there, Bob, you said there, there was one in particular that had, it looked like a big, like, rolling grill and a trailer on it. You said that would not be in violation of the current, but would be in violation of the existing. Now, where in here, because it says that it shall be parked on asphalt or concrete surfaces, but did, did we, what is the decision that on the previous, or the existing ordinance, it says impervious surface? Correct? We treated gravel as impervious. Okay, but it, what, is, what is the definition of impervious? not allowed to penetrate, correct? Right. Usually. So, can water penetrate gravel and go through gravel? Yes. So I would say that that example that was shown would still be, could be argued that that could be in violation of our current existing ordinance. Yes. That just because it's parked on gravel does not make it what, what, what the attorney did when he drafted this ordinance, right, um, and, and by no means is this, I believe um, somebody felt as though we, we might be trying to ram this through, um, by no means was that the case. There was, there was some things that were looked at, and when the attorney was asked to draft this for the board to review, in here he was more specific that it says it shall be parked on asphalt or concrete surfaces. Um, I think that's something that, with the existing ordinance, that needs to be clarified one way or another. Because you got mixed signals out there. Your ordinance says impervious surface, and yet you say, until code enforcement, if it's on gravel, it's okay. So what is it? So that would be my first question. And, and second, um, so out of all, that's pretty much every thing out there, right? When you went and did this? Probably 75%. Okay. Um, I, I seen two that would be affected by the proposed ordinance that are not affected currently, that are, what should I say, that are conforming now and legal. There was two there, and the one was, nobody knows what the length, you think it may have looked awfully small to me to be at 25 plus, but I'm, I'm still counting it as, sure. as two. So from what I've seen in the pictures, I've seen one that this would be affected by. That was yours? No, it's not mine. Mine wasn't in there. Mine's 37 feet long. Right. Okay. I'm on concrete. Oh, okay. Okay. So like, like I was saying is, I, I seen 
one, and, and if there's another one of somebody that's here that, that wasn't, their picture wasn't shown, that's two of that we know. And a possible third, it would all depend on the length of that trailer that would be affected by this. Right? Okay. So all those things that we've seen, those are all issues with existing ordinance as is that would be most of them. It, like I said, except for two, and then a possible third that wasn't, or a third that wasn't picture. Correct? Mm -hmm. And you are correct in the very beginning. I remember the discussion about impervious service, and we had to actually look it up. Yeah. yeah. But there is something that I come to mind that I would see, and this is totally off an impervious surface. Governor State University has an impervious surface, but it's actually made out of brick. It has holes in the brick. Right? It has holes well, in the water to pass through. So that's a different... It's a new conservation yeah. design. I, I, I'm just throwing that out of this discussion. Well, I mean, but when we look at... When you see, when you show a picture up there and you say, like to me, right? I, I was trying to keep track of tally marks, okay? Like, we saw 128 pictures, right? How many, if, if this ordinance were to even get brought forth to a vote, and if it were to pass, you know, how many of those 128 photos that we saw would be affected by this ordinance? And the answer is two. Is that 128 photos? I don't think Excuse so. Me? That, that could have been 128 pictures. I thought that's what you said it was going on. We originally had 128. There's no way that's 128. There's no way. I know that's what they no. said. Okay, well, whatever. Whatever. Uh, whatever it was. Yeah. Okay, so there was... There was we fell asleep in the middle. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I was told 128 when the slideshow yeah, started. That's what they so, said. Yeah. Um, that, that that's what <coughs> we we all know what the issues are. Um, they've been brought forth to us. Um, question is, what do we want to do about it, if anything? I really don't think, and I've talked about this for how many weeks. I don't think we have a problem. Um, we had one complaint come in. That complaint was taken care of. Um, I don't know. I, I can't see changing an ordinance. I, I can see interpreting it different, but um, to change it to what we want to change it to, I don't think we don't have a problem. So why, why change what we have? Well, and if most of those were against the ordinance that is existing, take care of those. And if we have complaints from the others, then we have a problem, we'll deal with that. But I say the people that are, are not following the ordinance as it exists, take care of those things. I honestly believe that we probably have to more strictly enforce our current ordinance because it's getting a little sloppy out there. I mean, when you got a guy that parts of both on an adjacent vacant lot, I would probably guarantee you the owner of that lot doesn't know that. You know, and we're going to just have to step it up and go after those kinds of violations because that, that should not be happening. You know? well, with what we have currently, the first situation that came up that started all this, could that continue to be an issue or is that over? No, if the that guy decided to push it. I think he went over there the next day. And right. Uh, he did it twice. We told him, hey, you can't park it on the grass because of the lot lines, etc. He was blocking the sidewalk. You know, because he kept it attached to. And unfortunately, a lot of the RVs now are getting larger. They're they're not getting any smaller. They're not getting, you know, the the old pop ups anymore. Everybody's getting bigger and bigger. And so it, it's a situation that he just wanted to get it off the street. Well, now we have we can park it on the street for three days. So. And I told him that. I did the intent there. He's going to put it there all winter. Oh, yeah. He thought he could just hook it up and that's the problem. do what he wanted. With it. There was also a third. Tip. Bottom line is he was taking advantage of the At, situation. Yes, right. Was. Exactly. How many times do you have to be told you can't do something? Right. And, you know, he finally got it and, you know, it was, it was taken care of. So, but yes, Marcy, in answer to your question, is what, the way I'm perceiving your question, um, what I thought I heard is yes, if he were to pour a concrete pad, Right there, you know, unhook the car, mm -hmm. obviously the truck, and it looks like it may have been needed to be backed up a few more feet. 
but it appears as though yes, he would have the distance on the five foot outside <coughs> if he were to snug it up to the house a little bit more. And yeah, he could park it right there. Then the 25 feet from the setback, so from his side of the edge of the sidewalk, 25 feet back, and as long as he's five feet off of a lot line, he's good. And again, that's what prompted all of this. It's not that we are picking on anybody or wanting to take away what you've been able to enjoy all this time. But you know, 15 years ago, we didn't have these subdivisions and we didn't have these big RVs. Right. And so, what do we do now? You know, it's 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 good in our older part of the village. We have bigger land and you know more lot lines and stuff. We have the room, but these subdivisions don't. And that's like Marcy was saying, we have to represent everybody. So we were trying to come up with something, some way to address this that would be fair to the old subdivisions and the new, and that the whole village could work with. Versus if we just said, okay, well we're gonna, these are good, they've been good all these years, they've followed the ordinance, but for this we have to start doing you know, this, you have to follow this, this, or this, then those people are gonna come over here and they're gonna have the same argument. So this is where we've been wrestling been wrestling with it for months now because where is the happy medium? We don't want to make anybody angry and you can't make everybody happy, but we have to be fair. So in all honesty, if this was our only situation at this time and it's resolved, that's great. But what happens now down the road if we get more and again, these RVs are made bigger nowadays? What do we do? To, do we just address it on a case by case? Is that fair? We've still, you know, we're not doing anything in our old part. It's it's a struggle. It's a wrestle. We're not trying to just pick on one person or one individual. We're just trying to make it fair for an entire community as it's grown, and we have to kind of balance that. That's and all even, we're trying you know, to plan do. Plan-wise, I know you guys have a big hill on the one side where Breers is parked. At some point, there were plans for a subdivision over there. So the hill goes, and suddenly you've got a house next door. Now we have a whole different scenario. You know, but our different. property line goes on top of that hill. So we made sure, we made every effort, we bought that house in 98, to make sure that we were to stay in compliance no matter what the village built. So, and, and, and again, if I can speak, Mr. Mayor. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, that's okay. I um, Is that going back? And I understand what you're saying about the new subdivision. We made a ride last night. We drove around. The lots are smaller in the new subdivision than the old one. I agree with you. But if I have a 26 foot, which you couldn't tell by that picture, a foot difference on a trailer, I can ha I can't have it. It makes no sense to me. Either it fits on the lot or it doesn't. As long as I'm behind the house line, they're still going to be the same height if they're 25 feet tall. My version of my motorhome goes from 24 feet to 45 feet. If I get a 25, guess what? It's the same height. It's still going to be just as tall. And it's still going to be behind my house. The only thing different, it's not that close to my back lot line. So I'm just giving you guys food for thought to think. Um, when you're talking about this, I understand you have to go for everybody. Well, I'm everybody too. And I made an effort and made an investment in this town when I purchased that house to make sure I stayed in compliance with your rules. Now, if you change it, that means that maybe some of us will end up having to move out because I'm not moving my motor. I'm going to have to move out. I will not put it in storage. Thank you. So, uh, I think somebody else had questioned why 25 feet. And the idea of the 25 foot was that um, that is a setback that's required by builders. Um, so anything that's 25 foot or smaller would fit in a driveway. Um, and that would hopefully alleviate the idea of even somebody constantly leaving it on the site. Okay, well, I can park this in my driveway for still within three days with the proposed and the current ordinance, but in the older section of town, um, somebody that's, that would still fit in that, it kind of feeds through to where even in the back with the reserves, they could even be some of the trailers that you've seen that would still be in. And compliance. So that was, that's kind of where the number kind of shot from because I don't even think a 25 foot trailer is something that's made. I think they go in different measurements, but um, so that's why the number 25. Um, and I gotta stopped. be honest, one of the more disturbing pictures I saw is the one with the grayish taupe house with the very little setback in the rear. That's something that's 
perfectly legal to have that trailer behind it, and that's probably the same or worse scenario than the one in Hunter's Chase, where those people look out that back window, and there's no, no matter what you do on that one, that's perfectly legal. The one that backed up the field? No, the, the one where it was... Um, by the school the corner corner the yellow house, the and there's a gray one right there. Was that the yellow one with the trailer in the back, and then there was the oh, corner the house. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, this was brought up last time we discussed this, and this is something that bothers me. And I don't care which one it comes out of, but if it's, uh, well, I do care. Um, but if it's deal with police department or code, it should be in public safety. Why are we doing one ordinance for trailers in public safety one month and the next month that's coming out of a different committee? If you guys want all, the all of that stuff to go to zoning, then send it there. That's fine. But now you're going to start having competing ordinances with competing committees. So it should all come out of the phone through one place, especially if it's going to deal with code and police department. There is no code in the police department right now. It's in zones. So we're trying to create one for that when it goes in. When well, it this goes is in. creating an ordinance. So what would well, once that do with it? When that ordinance is created, it then turns over to you because he handles it. Right now, it's the zoning administrator that basically handles it. That he is going through him. I know it's a little confusing. I agree with you. They should mirror each other. But once it comes part of the municipal code, though, the zoning administrator is out of it. It's strictly a Least matter I understand, but if yeah. we pass this today, it does not need to go through the public safety committee to be passed again, does it? No, no, but that's okay. entirely so that, that, that's what I'm saying. You're having this coming out of plan and zoning, where the last one we did, and I understand it's different, it's different circumstances, but it was still with trailers, and that came out of public safety. So why is there two different committees? Because they're doing the same thing. Yeah, there was an ordinance in zoning that we were creating in public safety. So same thing here. There's an ordinance in zoning. Operating in public safety, the same thing. Okay. So the, the last thing that I'll share on this is that um, the, the some of the thoughts also and, and questions from constituents um, that came forward was then, okay, what about backyards and corner lots and and everything else and and that's just kind of where this came from is that um, yeah there was an issue um, it was addressed what whether or not that it's gonna come back I mean this issue moved to town at the end of summer and I mean there was two issues within a very short amount of time uh, my gut tells me that issue is gonna be back it's gonna be parked over the sidewalk or it's going to be whatever, no matter what ordinance is in place, existing or, or new. Um, but the, the other question is, is residents are asking what else is going to be allowed then? You know, when you talk about quarter acre lots in a subdivision that was approved before, you know, and most of us were here, um, you know, that, that ordinance that, that's in place was approved in one bomb. Our zoning ordinance? Yeah. The, no, the existing ordinance. I would say we wrote, we wrote... I thought it said it was 1997. Yeah, we did a comprehensive rewrite of the total zoning code in 04, 05. But I can't say if that ordinance was changed or not. I can't remember. But, but this specific ordinance was done in 97. Seven. Yeah. So, and that was done before you had subdivisions with quarter acre lots. You know, and you approve subdivisions with quarter acre lots. Some things might need to change as to what was permissible in a rural town um, with half acre to plus lots and throughout the majority of town to when you shrink lot sizes and allow in more residential. See, even with your quarter acre lots, you're not going to be able to fit these large motor homes or trailers on these lots with the current ordinance with the setback lines and, and everything else. No, but I, you know where you will be able to fit them? Scott, smack dab in the middle of the backyard. And that's what will come when people are told they can't park them here. You can't park them on the driveway. You can't park them on the street after three days. I don't have the room on the side of my lots. What's left? Where are they going to park it? I can tell you where they're going to park it. Because I've seen the one guy starting to take down a fence, which is 
I got a feeling possibly where his thoughts are maybe with his camper. Yeah, my thoughts are is it's not broke, you know, why fix it? You know, I mean, we, this ordinance has been in effect since 1997, which is 20 years. Before you allowed all these new residential subdivisions with quarter acre lots. Can you tie anything to lot size? Yes, you can, um, but you have to do it village wide. You can't say in these subdivisions you can't do that, these subdivisions you can. You can say in any lots less than one acre, this is the law. If you want to do it on a zoning basis, it has to go through the zoning code. You know, it would have to go through the planning and zoning commission. If you wanted to say R1A, you can do this, R1B, you can do that, R1, you can do this, in different zoning classifications throughout the village. Um, you can't tie it to whether there's an attached or detached garage or something like that. You're getting into a zoning issue now. Yeah. It becomes more of zoning and less municipal code. And then you've got to run that through the planning and zoning commission. Because um, I have to be honest with you, when you've got a detached garage with a super long lot and the garage is way in the back and you can easily park a trailer and it goes nowhere near the front of the house and nowhere near the sides, it's a whole different ball game than when somebody has an attached garage up front and they're trying to do, you know, what started this whole thing. That would be a question for the village attorney, uh, whether or not you could specify attached or detached garages in the municipal code and not the zoning code. I mean, you've got alleys and, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of things that factor into that that are less mm -hmm. of a nuisance than when you've got more congested living areas with people, you know, jamming in between houses and up towards the sidewalk. That being said, to me, you have two options. You can, someone can make a motion to approve. Or someone can make a motion also to refer to the planning and zoning. And because in my, just if I can, uh, in my opinion, I think the ordinance is incomplete as written. And I'll give you some examples. It is legal to put a trailer right now or a mobile home in someone's backyard as long as it's going to be on a concrete pad. But there's nothing that says how you get to that concrete pad. So you put it up, pull it in and out of that concrete grit pad, and now you're creating ruts in the grass, and that looks just as bad as probably this mobile home in the backyard. I had a concern in the very beginning. I knew of one case, I now know of two cases, three cases, of where an individual in the past has actually created a concrete pad to allow this. We approved it, we allowed it. At one meeting, it was illegal. Today, it happens to be. Like it was illegal, now it has to be legal. But anyway, somebody took the proper steps to pour a pad, and there's no way to grandfather it. We have a gentleman here tonight that I happen to know came into the village hall sometime back. He owns a uh, acre. Right, 2.6 acres. 2.6 acres. Okay, and he's in a uh, residential estate. Residential estate. So you have this big piece of property that he's not going to be able to park a camper in his back, which is the point I think you make. Okay, and then we have another family tonight that testified that they bought the mobile home for this purpose. They have it there. Yes, I could see down the road where I think it might hang over the sidewalk if there's ever a subdivision built. I'm not sure. Uh, no. 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 Okay, maybe it doesn't. But anyways, they went through the steps. So in other words, there's nothing grandfathering these people that actually did try to comply with the law back then, and now they're not going to be able to comply with the law. Um, and that was a thought of mine. I did even ask, is there some way we can grandfather the ones who have been in compliance all these years? So but there wasn't. My opinion is, I don't think we're finished. I think we've got a lot of ifs. We've got a lot of open loopholes. And I don't think we're being fair for the people that made a substantial step towards doing something right, and now it's wrong. It just doesn't sit right. So, what's the question? I think you should go through a public hearing and let people come in here and, and voice their opinions. In which case, then it would be a motion to refer to finance. I, I, I'll, I'll say this so one last thing on this, and, and I, I'll, I'll let it take its proper steps. And as everyone knows, and if the audience doesn't know, I'm the one who received numerous complaints about a few of these. Okay, um, and. Um, one thing I will say is, is we need to think about this. When we put ordinances in place throughout our village dictating 
height fence requirements, see-through requirements, privacy, non-privacy, everything else. And this isn't a concern of ours. 25 foot, 32, 36, what was your 37 foot trailers? We're worried about, I know people that have been denied a six foot privacy fence to keep people from looking into their backyard with children and stuff like that. Usually you have to have a pool to get this special variance allowed, right? So we're that particular about a five foot fence versus a six foot fence. We're that particular for our residents on whether or not you have three quarter inch spacing or 50% spacing between your boards and your fence. No wood, no chain link, only vinyl ornamental iron. We say all these things, in, but we will say that it's okay. Park a 37 foot tick trailer in your backyard. Something to think about. Okay. But if it's uh, if that's the the chairman's uh, if that's her recommendation to, to send it to uh, PZC, let the process play out. Just to hey, I'd be happy to relook at that fence. Just <laughs> ordinance. And that's been brought up before. Where I share some of your same opinion. And you and a lot of discussion has taken place today and at the meetings. There's very good points being taken. I just don't think it's done yet. No, I, 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 I'm, there's, I'm, by no means is anyone trying to ramrod this through or anything. You can have public hearings, and next time I'll be ensured to invite the people that I know that, you know, have issues with this. Um, I think that's you know, the point of the public hearing. So, yeah, you know, make sure that they know also. And, um, yeah, I mean, you, let, let the process take it a different step or a different direction. Run it through police, I don't care. I mean, at some point, I think it'll come back up again. I think it's an issue that we're going to be dealing with here in the future as a board. Yeah, but I agree. I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's cooked yet the way it should be. No, and one of their emphasis that I made, I made at the last meeting, what is in violation with the current ordinance should be enforced. Absolutely. So the first suggestion would be is go back, tell the acting chief and then the new chief, wherever it may be, that what the current ordinance is should be enforced, and I grant if there's exception to every rule, but the bottom line is we have ordinance that's in place, they should be enforced. I still think if you enforce the current ordinance, the one that brought this to attention would be taken care of. Sure. But there's a lot of violations on there that probably should be addressed, and they should be addressed. It's not fair to the people that are trying to do it right. So, recommendation. Well, in all honesty, our whole thing was just sitting down, and we were just trying to be fair to the entire community. Um, we Obviously, it's not done yet because there's lots of questions on both sides. Um, perhaps it should go to planning and zoning so we can have a public hearing so that way the ones who are having issues can speak their voice as well. And then we have everything to go by and then hopefully put something together that is going to be fair for everyone. So I make a motion to refer to planning, refer to planning and zoning. Is there a second? Second. Any questions in motion? Whaling? No. Yes. Missouri? Yes. Firms? Yes. Meyer? Yes. Hazel? Yes. Just to make a note, the PZC and workshop to come up with any variation of this if they wish to hold hearing and recommend it back to you guys in a totally different form than what you're looking at today, just to let you know that could happen. And then you have the right to change it again. Mm -hmm. Just for the audience, there would be hearings. You would be notified of the hearings at Mount Mount Um. Yeah, we will post hearings on our new Facebook page. We'll post hearings on our website. Uh, we'll do the papers as usual and post. And I believe she knows when the hearings are. She'll get the word out from that side. We'll get the word out. That's assuming the planning and zoning committee agrees to have a hearing. That's correct. That's correct. Stuff to your workshop first. Sorry, I know you've been dying. I, I'm sorry, I'm not one, used one to it. I'm not, I apologize, okay. I, I'm not used to this. Don't worry about it. Um, one thing you guys are, you guys are saying variance off the property line. Hunter's Chase over there, I work for Terratech. If I was the current, I would never buy over there because I do have a camper I had it before there. 
if you guys are gotten five foot off the property line, you got to be back. And like you said, I agree. I don't want to see somebody's camper sitting in the backyard. But you got to build a road to get to it. And I drive a truck for a living for the city, in the city. There's no way your, your neighbor is going to grant you to drive through his property to get that trailer back in there. I, I would I, agree, but there's two houses just literally across the street from me that are corner lots, both face different directions. You would not need anybody's permission to drive it. You can back it right in. Yeah, well, if, if there's there's houses yeah. that yeah, are facing north nice. south, right, and there's, there's a street a running north south yeah. parallel with it, mm -hmm. and they're on a corner, they're on the end of a block, you could pull right in, driving straight west pretty, pretty or straight much, east. I'm most, sorry. Most of the corner lots in Hunter's Chase, yeah. you wouldn't need anything. I don't know how the other ones run it. Yeah, pretty much all of them at that point made like it made for the driveway. There's a couple situations like that where it can't happen. So. Hey, and like you, like you were saying about back in the, you know, if you had your driveway back all the way out there, I mean, um, Don Church, um, Pinazzo has a beautiful house and beautiful acres. This is all stone. So on the, court, on the ordinance, we're not allowed to have it on stone? That's According to the proposed end? Technically, the current one. Now, what about not not ask us afterwards? Or ask me back. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Safety I'm committee right. cross. Thank you. Uh, the police department, EMA, and code enforcement monthly reports are enclosed for your review. Full time police officer hiring list has been established after interviews, and three officer candidates are on this list for posted correct at the police department. I don't know if the list was posted. I don't know if he was or not yet. Okay. Both not, it will be. Should be. Corporal promotion update. This process is proceeding for the promotion, possible promotion of two officers to the rank of corporal. This process was begun under the former chief, and it was decided to continue with the process he started. Interviews were today, and the results will follow. For the results of the Halloween patrols, no major incidents were reported. And the tenant's not here. Dennis, do you have something? Or? I just want to say, uh, yeah, I think both the EMA and police department, we were out in force, uh, covered all the subdivisions, handed out candy again, went up to the park, and we literally had no calls of uh, vandalisms or incidents. I think, I mean, I know my subdivision, it's always an animal house there, it's just people <laughs> everywhere. Um, and I sent an email to uh, Acting Chief, I think Dennis, and you guys, just, it was, I saw officers out walking around, he and he was out there, it was, I think it was a very good show of force uh, in general, and uh, everyone had a good time as far as I can see. And that is all I have. I got a couple questions. Um, um, the, I'm just curious, is that, so we, we have our EMA, and uh, we're, we're keeping track of hours, what we're doing for, um, things in outside of village limits and that. I'm just curious as to why we're doing activities in other towns that aren't even beach. Can you ask if it's mutual aid request? No, we did a uh, um, robbery preparedness and response procedures for a bank in Bradley. That would, that would be EMA, that'd be that was part of our community policing, using the EMA people as role players. Uh, I, they were at one of our robbery prevention here in town. They saw our program and they asked if I would do it, which I did. So we conducted it for Bradley, or we just said Bradley was there all years. Bradley was there. Also. We were running it. We did the robbery prevention and the role play. Yes. Was that an EMA function or a police department function? Police department. I did that on my own time. So, but it's listed under, well, I guess it's listed under EMA to me. For the volunteers, yes. So, was that done through EMA or through the police department? Through the police department using EMA. So, I guess my next question is why are we paying police officers to do a program for? Okay, I did this on my own time. So then it wasn't through the police department, then it was through EMA. They contacted us through the police department. Because they attended one here that I did. 
So nobody nobody got paid for going. No. Okay. Okay. That was on Columbus Day. That was October 9th. That was all time. Okay. That's it then for me. Just going to call the board to me, trustee for us. Let me get back to him. I had a Zoom. Time. <laughs> <laughs> So, water billing <clears throat> register is enclosed for your review, along with your water department and sewer department monthly reports. Um, the water billing register for the months of September and October are enclosed for your review. Um, September was a dry month and usage was relatively high. Um, in there, in case everyone's seen it, I mean, we've talked about it before, um, the pump to bill ratio was 69.35. Um, in that time, we did do um, hydrant flushing. So, uh, if you look in your packet, and there are some numbers that I don't know if that's necessarily what was used or not used for the flushing. Um, there's no way to tell. Um, over the years, water, lace ratio, water loss ratio has been uh, that it is but somewhat acceptable. Um, the AWWA and IEPA, um, they really haven't come out and said, like, this is an acceptable percentage, um, whether it's 10%, 15%, 20%, 30%. Um, it, it appears there's, Bob enclosed a bunch of literature on this one for you guys. Um, uh, somewhere in the middle there is, seems to be about 20. Um, we were definitely below that. I will attribute some of that to... I would think a good majority of that to, to flushing. Buddy, you got anything you want to add to uh, the pump to bill ratio? Well, like I said, I'm not going to get into this big argument, or I won't call it an argument <coughs> discussion. We have a difference of opinion. But I can tell you this, that um, just on one hydrant on the south end of town, I, I, I pulled um, 480,000 gallons in the billing period on one hydrant alone. Since that time, there was a couple of fires. The fire department was out there playing, and it doesn't, we had a main break. And it doesn't account for, um, like I said, we had end of the year flushing also. So this is kind of an exaggerated number. Um, I have been tracking um, on Thursdays. We have been hitting some uh, problematic areas. Also, I was, I've been pulling different waters from, uh, we had well four that was down. My chlorine I, uh, was on the north end of town, and I had received complaints, and I was having issues having residual down at the south end of town. So I have to systematically pull it down, and that also, um, you know, the only way I can do that is by opening a hydrant and letting it flow. Um, that's everything. I, I'll, I'll keep it short, sweet, and simple, but that's my answer that I have for that. What are you at historically with that percentage? It, it, it bounces. It, that, that's what's crazy. I mean, are we around 70 normally? or? We've had it as high as 80s. 80s. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, there's... And it's been as low as, I mean, just in the time I've been a trustee, it's been, it's been as low as 56%. You know, where if you hit a, a, a billing cycle where you have these major main breaks on Penfield, which shouldn't happen anymore, but, um, I mean, that, there was, it was a month where we had, like, I mean, it was like chasing a, right. you know, chasing the break. Yeah, you just, yeah, you're just chasing it one after another after another. You fix it, and... As soon as before you're done patching up, you know, and dumping the gravel, finishing the hole, you know, it's it's leaking, you know, 300 feet down the main again. Um, it, it all depends, and it, it, I was kind of curious as to all the information and literature that kind of came out of nowhere on this one, in this packet with it. Um, you know, we've we've purchased as a board, we've gone ahead and we've purchased um, detection stuff equipment for our department to use. To try to identify this, um, you know, I, I personally have made the recommendation um, to staff to let's start metering on meter. Put a meter in the fire department. If we're going to give them free water, meter it. At least know what they're using. Meter their irrigation system at the schools. If you're not going to bill them, that's fine. Meter it. Know what you're giving away. So that way, when you do a pump to bill, 
all you're doing is you're saying, okay, at our three wells, we're pumping this much water. And all you're comparing it to is what our billing register says when Donna does the bills at the end. We have numerous, the community hall building is unmetered water. There's, there's numerous unmetered water throughout the village. Well, you're going to hide the you put a meter on hydro. You, yeah. you could. I do. That's how and, I can and so, give the numbers. So for this to kind of come out like this and would there be so much data backing it up as to what, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, so why, ha why haven't we in the past just cost? I mean, why, so haven't we build, why haven't we metered these things? I don't I mean, know. If we're not going to build these people, that's fine. But, I mean, then would that help you figure out your ratios? Oh, it would help my cause against death. And, I have, like I said, we have personally, you know, uh, what we control with the fire hydrants. I don't have any control when there's a fire in town. I don't have any control of metering it. We have to well, when empower them, I guess, you know, there's a big question. The meters that go on the hydrants, they're a couple, they're about 2300 bucks. When there's an actual emergency, I mean, do you want a fire department? No, we're so we're no. but, that, uh, the but there's numerous times where there. the department goes out and does training. And I don't see any emergency rush if they're going out to do a training where they can't put a meter on. They're supposed to give us reports monthly right. on water usage. They could tell by the gallons pumped by their tankers, trucks, whatever they want to call them. Do they? Have they been? I haven't gotten one since before I went and seen. Since there's been a change of administration. Right. There's there's some things going on over there. Yes. Matt Matthew Ryan's gone down there and talked to him. Now. I don't so know. Matthew Ryan goes down there, he doesn't talk to him, they don't talk to him, then maybe Bob and I need to go down and talk to him and tell him if you don't do this, we're going to do that. There you go. Okay. So, <laughs> so, water billing register, anyone have a question about the pump to ratio of 69.35%? No. There's plenty of data, there's 20 pages for you to read about water loss there. Um, well, for update, uh, bearing was replaced in the motor, uh, $1,875. Um, this is something Buddy reported on last time. Uh, the motor was placed back on the pump shaft and calibrated for uh, 2500. Uh, turned the well back on, no vibration. Shaft everything seems to be working. Um, the well is back online. Um, any questions about that? I know that was, came up. Chestnut uh, street light update. I spoke to Bud. Um, the lights, we have received the lights now. Um, they came in this afternoon. Um, so should be uh, moving ahead with getting someone over there to auger that in and move forward with that project. Um, brush and leaf collection update. Um, it's a very late fall. Public Works will be picking up leaves through Friday, December 1st. Um, it means the last pass is scheduled for Monday, December 27th. Leaves have to be raked to the curb by 7.30 on that day to be guaranteed to be picked up. Um, I spoke to Buddy about this today. And um, I told him I was going to think about this, and, and to me, because I, I explained that there's way too many trees that, mm -hmm. that you still got leaves on them. you you got to bump back the deadline. I know in a perfect world, you sit there and you can say, okay, December 1st, we're done, but if you have a, a late fall like this and the leaves aren't done, all it's going to do is create a mess if you don't get them picked up. And the 10 to 14 day outlook looks like it's going to stay in the 40s. So yeah, so I would recommend uh, moving forward with it, at least till snow starts flying. Even after the first light snowfall or two, that's probably going to melt. And just leave everything rigged up, ready to go to, for leaf pickup I mean, until you see the leaves off the trees. Okay. Um, Route 1 shoulder winding update. I got nothing on it. it was just yeah, I on, so they, they, they still have to do some rumble strip work. It's my understanding on the north end of town. That's a half day's worth of work. They're going to wait until they get the south half done. They are working south of town. I don't know how far they are. I don't know how they're getting blacktop, but I guess it's not warm enough for them to get blacktop. Uh, but they're coming up. They went down the west side first, and they're coming up the east side. So their, their goal is to get that project done before Christmas. And I got to let them continue to work. I know it's not one of our projects and it's I got, but anything about when we first get to the fork coming south, I know they only did these, the outer part of the road, but there's like another big divot on the inside part, kind of where the road goes in. It's a little bit. Do they say anything about fixing the other side as well for danger reasons? Uh, they're supposed to do both shoulders, both sides. Okay, of the so road. they're going to do the inside as well? 
the inside. Inside shoulder, like where the road forks in. So you've got your good now. Oh, yeah. on that corner. Where the horseshoes are. That's part of 390. They consider that part of 394. Until it narrows down to a real 22 foot wide two lane, they consider that 394 not rough. Makes sense. That's like another yeah. little big danger spot there. So I was just curious. They were going to correct that as well. Well, turning update, um, buddy, you got that Simpson out today? Started today. Yeah. Should um, be done by the end of the week. The village is on a, a three year plan. Um, we got the town pretty much, it's, it's something that, that continually happens every year. Um, the valve turning happens. The town's basically broken up into thirds, and every year a company comes in and they exercise all the valves. Um, it helps in, to ensure that they're, they're in working order when you do have a main break or something like that. Um, it, it definitely helps the water system. And then a decoration update. Um, it wasn't quite dark enough when we drove in tonight, but I'm sure... I noticed that uh, street banners are all down and the snowflakes yep. are up. So it's going to be dark when we leave. Yeah, sure is. <laughs> they were lit. I could see one. That's all. Just That's no it. I, I Any one. questions? They're lit. Just the yeah. one snowflake in front of Midland Bank went out. So that concludes my report. Economic development, Trustee Mayor. Facebook page update. Um, it's rolling along. I, the last <coughs> I looked, we had 446 followers, 427 likes. We're inching up to 500. Um, the highest post so far was the first one announcing the page. That was at 2,937 views. So that includes people that share it to their pages and people who look at it. Um, it's been going okay. We've got some automatic posts going up and um, they're posting some other things as well. I think we've had about three comments total. That were, yeah, nothing. Somebody questioned one of the postings and, you know, one or two others that were just, you know, regular comments. So. It's been going well. Um, Beach your Vietnam Veterans Ceremony? It was a very nice ceremony. Uh, there was five people from our area that were uh, George Scudema, Chuck Payne, myself, Greg Tweedy from the AMVETS, and there was Jimmy Gelsky. Jimmy mm -hmm. yeah. So it was all five of us that were uh, honored, and uh, it was a beautiful ceremony. And, uh, <coughs> very nice, very nice what they did for the veterans. Uh, sesquicentennial update. Okay, my report. <laughs> <laughs> that is my report. <laughs> we just want to hear you say it. I know. Just, 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 just to bring you up to date, there's, I believe, 42 applications as of today with the police chief process. I would guess Jeanette was correct. We have 42? Approximately 42. Approximately, Approximately 42. 42. And what we intend to do is right after the selection or the uh, advertising portion of the process is ending probably this week, so I've already dropped off the radar. The applications are due by the end of the day, December 1st. Half, right after that, we'll combine combine a uh, or make a Excel spreadsheet for you to give you a synopsis of the individuals that applied. Uh, where they're working now, their current rank and years of service, so that you will have that ahead of time. And then when you get down to the interview process, as far as you are concerned, uh, we will give you information ahead of time, so when you get to the interview process, you will have that all ahead of time. And tonight we do have our area management here, uh, once we take a break, that's going to ask you some few questions, and I'm sure you're going to ask him some few questions. Uh, so when we go to that, we'll get to there. Create CSX Intermodal, I have no information except, like I said, I believe last meeting was they did sign an agreement with Crete. Uh, the gentleman has not gotten back to me as of yet. Uh, with that, I have nothing else. Is there any old business to come before the board? Just, just to note that uh, next week marks the one year mark and then CSX put an option on it. Any new business to come before the board? May I ask for a motion to recess for five minutes? So move. Second. And there's a second. We'll call. Yes. 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 Yes.